My guest today is Australian film and television star Louis Mandalore, who returns to the big screen reprising his role as Nick Portacalis in the third installment of the smash hit comedy My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3, hitting theaters nationwide on September 8th, 2023. Now, the film will open just over 20 years after My Big Fat Greek Wedding established itself as the top-grossing romantic comedy of all time. Now, Louis Mandelar's film career continues to shine and grow, including his work opposite of Scott Atkins in The Debt Collector films a few years ago, which led to work on Rambo, Last Blood, Memory, opposite of Liam Neeson, and The Battle for Saipan, in which Louis did all of his own stunt work. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome one of the hardest working and busiest men in Hollywood, actor, producer, and director, Louis Mandalore. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Beautiful introduction, Ward. Thanks for having me here. Well, you're very, very welcome. And uh, let me just kind of kick this off with the brand new movie coming out. How surprised are you to see that My Big Fat Greek Wedding grew into a three, a, a threequel, I guess is what we'll call it. Yeah, um, I think we're all pretty surprised. This business is rough enough uh, as it is, and we all know that. It's a, it's a volatile world, as we say. So to get uh, a trequel, a threequel, whatever you want to call it, as you put it, it's, uh, it's a blessing, especially with this one. Um, you know, it's a comedy. It's not one of those action things, which puts it on a different level to me. It's, it's a rare. It's rare, really, right? I don't know. Is it? I think so. It but, is. Uh, it is yeah. rare. You know, it was funny because I mean, it's funny that you brought that up because my my wife and I, you know, we love Ben watching shows and movies, and we've all noticed that every film out besides all of the 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 superhero movies that keep coming out over and over again, and we see tons of action. I love action films. I love spy thrillers, but it's the romantic comedies that we don't see like we used to, let's say 10, 15 years ago, and we need more of those. No, I agree. I agree. The business has changed. I got here, I got into the business in 89. Oh, actually, I got to LA in 89, but soon after that. So I remember when that change happened, the movies of the week, the the, the romantic comedies, and just, you know, the, those movies in general. So it's getting back to the question, I guess it's a blessing, and to do them over such a long period of time. And another note, uh, is that to do a sequel 15 or 20 years later and then the third one another 15 years later. I mean, that's pretty unheard of, which brings us to the the, the heart of, of, I think, the question. Uh, Father Gus, Michael Constantine, was not only a dear friend, he was a leader and a, and a talent and a beautiful soul. And I do believe it was an homage to him and um, that made it special. The The script itself and the screenplay is fantastic. It's it's built around a lot of heartstrings, and I think it's going to be beautiful. So I'm excited. Yeah, and I'm blessed to be part of the third one. Well, I was going to ask you about Michael. I mean, he, him being the, the patriarch, so to speak, of the whole cast. I mean, what was the presence like on set without him being there? Um, it, it was amazing. I mean, in a sense, he was there. You know, I mean, we all knew why we were there, and it was a big part of him, you know, because of him. Um, obviously, Nia is the captain and uh, she steered the ship and it was a great experience. But man, yeah, we all felt it. I know I did and I know a few other people did. It was a, a very special poignant script, especially in my life personally, which I won't go into right now. But as you get older, you know, life changes and you start having to deal with some realities. And I think this movie touches on heart and dealing on some harsh realities. And I think that's one of the best comedies that I like to endure is something that's not only funny, has a little shtick, but then, you know, it hits you a little heartstring and it, it gets you. So it has that complete genre of emotions and I'm excited. And Michael obviously had a big, a, a lot to do with that. Well, yeah. what is your fondest memory of, of Michael uh, on set? <laughs> um, there's a lot, but I remember in the second one where it was more or less uh, the parent's story, him and Laney had the, the main story and uh, Michael had a lot to do, a lot. And I remember watching him. I mean, besides the, the years of fun and laughs, you know, he's just a great guy. We had so many laughs. So I remember watching him, seeing him dance and jump around and just really push that second one. And he was the life of the party. He's just a great man, man. So, you know, there's a lot of moments. But I remember him on Fat 2 just having an absolute ball, dancing literally in between shots. You know, and it being is. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, I, funny. I think the magic of the of this movie um is the multiple cast of characters. And everybody has their favorites. I mean, I, I hear from so many people saying, Oh, Nick's my favorite. And <laughs> I had people when when uh some of my colleagues found out that I was interviewing you, they're like, Oh my gosh. I just love him. I, I, I want I want to see, you know, I can't wait to see the, the third installment of the film. But I think that's why this this series of films have been so successful because there's multiple characters. Uh, the synergy is absolutely incredible in in the film. But everybody always has their favorite lines. It's, it's like the when the first one came out. You know, there's these little one-liners that we all walk around and it's almost like it pops in your head and you have to quote it out loud if something happens yeah. in your life. Uh, yeah. You know, how many of us have ever been in the kitchen and somebody makes a, a bunt cake and we look down and we think of this movie? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great. The characters, excuse me, are actually what make it. And it's funny, I think it even made the trailer for the second one, but uh, the aunt, Andrea Martin's character, always a, a, ste a scene stealer she is she's just magnificent but if you remember the trailer she says i will be your favorite i mean i just laugh <laughs> when she introduces herself by the way i'm going to be the i'm you know it's so she actually says that <laughs> well, is, and she's right because everybody loves her too but every character is lovable and you and you don't see that in a whole lot of films and you brought up the point that what it's uh was it, you said 15 years between the first and the second one? I do believe it was that, yeah. And then I it's been, what, 10 years for the third one? I, You know, I I think it's approximately those numbers, yeah, but it's a long time in between them. More so with the first and second than the second and third, but still, you know, it's been a long time. Well, are you surprised? Uh, well, let, let's go back to the first one because, you know, it became a smash hit. I mean... I guess the whole cast was probably, uh, well, not only grateful, but shocked. Yeah, we knew we had a good movie. You know, you you have an understanding of when you're on set, you, you feel like, hey, this is going to be enjoyable. It's a nice film, but who knew? But I do recall the timing. It was it was uh, pretty interesting. I, I might, it's worth sharing the story real quick. Rita Wilson actually shared this with me. It's something like this. I'm sure it's changed in my head over the years. But when Nia made that with... with uh, Playtime with uh, Tom Hanks, Gary Getzman, and Rita Wilson when they produced it. They put it in the can. I think they had a deal with Lionsgate. There was a lot of money that went into PR, but it was after the horrible 9 11 years. I think it was soon after that. And I do recall like Hearts War coming out with Bruce Willis and all these war films. And I was thinking, where is our little film, man? It just disappeared. I think it was two years where I think a studio said there's. They weren't going to gamble on it, ultimately. This is a true story. And then time passed. Someone spoke with Playtime. I forget the gentleman's name. Then they came out with a little plan, and that's when they released it on the outskirts of those cities. And everyone was yearning for some love, some family, and some, some laughs. Like you were just saying, there was no romantic comedy. So I think the timing was fantastic. And then, obviously, it snowballed with that unbelievable marketing plan that they had. And we, we had a lightning in the bottle. It's pretty damn rare, but it happened because I think the movie substantiated what the, the public really needed and really wanted. And I think it's always needed. A good comedy, come on, man, there's always time for a good romantic comedy, and uh, especially then. So then the legend began, and uh, here we are. Like, what is it? I mean, uh, 20 years later? 25? Yeah, I think it was uh, just a tick over 20 years. I know the first one grossed. 386 million which okay. is great back in the day but ladies and gentlemen here's something that you may not know this is actually classified as an indie film mm -hmm. which makes it that much more special because yeah. you know Nia had she had a vision and she accomplished it too she sure did. And there's a wonderful story. Again, Rita, Rita Wilson shared this with me. And I love sharing it because I share it sometimes when I'm having friends over because it's unreal. Just life. And I believe Nia was doing a one-woman show in Hollywood. And Rita happened to be in town with Tom. And I think Tom had some business. And she opened up the LA or the Hollywood Reporter, apparently, and said, oh, what's this? Literally. I remember she did that. She said a Greek uh, one-woman show. So being uh, Greek, Rita 
went to the show and after the show she said nia do you have a script and nia tells the story real cool where rita says do you have a script and before she could say script she's like Zip. <laughs> perfect <laughs> hollywood <laughs> yeah man so that's that's actually actually how it happens so you ask yourself if nia didn't do the show and risk and put herself out there with a wonderful talent if she didn't, excuse me, what would have happened if Rita didn't decide to open the paper? What would have happened? But it did happen, and here we are. So, yeah. Well, just think, no elevator pitch needed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and now for the, for the third one, y'all actually filmed this one in Greece, correct? Yes, uh, part Athens and part on the island of Corfu. What was that like? It was wonderful, but it's interesting. I just... I share this with my friends. This is why there's no rhyme or reason. And if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, all those little sayings that you hear over the years, because I just did two back-to-back -back World War II movies in Thailand. Bombs, bullets, explosions, running through jungles, mosquitoes. It was just horrible as far as circumstances and, and uh, the level of work uh, energy you needed. So going to Greece, I thought, ah, oh, time to relax. You know, just an actor, and I'm going to do a romantic comedy comedy on the Greek island. How hard can that be? And that must have that almost felt like a vacation to you, didn't it? Actually, my point is on the contrary. It was really difficult, man. It was an incredible experience. Yeah, I mean, it amazed all of us. It was just so hot, and making a movie, I learned again. There's so many moving parts, and there's there's a lot of pressure, and making a motion picture film, it's a lot of work. And uh, it was an amazing experience, but it was still a lot of work, you know. Yeah, well, I, I mean, well, the moment you get on set, I mean, do you can you literally uh, instantly flip the switch in your nick? I can. I, I've, I've over the years, I don't mind. You know, I mean, I'm in it, but I don't mind having conversations. Obviously, when you have a sense and a, an awareness of the set and the timing getting close, you disassociate. But ultimately, yeah, I can I can adjust pretty quick. I like having a good time. Yeah, no problem. Well, well, you know, so, you know, you're, you're very, you're, you're famously known as Nick. Now, when you're seen in public, do fans call you Nick out in public? I was telling this story in Greece just last week. I had a scout. It's funny because as an actor, you always, if you, you know, if you have that opportunity in this business, <laughs> which is rare, but if you get a chance, you want that, I, I like De Niro, you know, are you talking to me? And Schwarzenegger <laughs> says, I'll be back. Well, I have a Nick one and I get stopped everywhere, but it's nothing cool. It's I have Tria Archidia. Do you know what that means, Ward? Am I allowed no, to say No, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the first one, when he, I say to him, tell everyone to go inside, he says, how do I say it? Big John Corbett. And uh, I say to him, Echo Tria Archidia. He says, Echo Tria Archidia. You remember now? I remember now. Yes. <laughs> how to say what it means? Uh, but anyway, that's, that's my cliched line. And, and I have families and kids calling it out to me on the street. And I'm like, oh, man, couldn't it be something cool? But it is. We get a good laugh out of it. Well, yeah, but see, that that's, that is the absolute beauty of Spencer. film and cinema. You know, it's kind of like when I talk to recording artists. There are songs that stick with us for life because maybe something happened and we hear the song. But with movies... When we, especially when we watch something like My Big Fat Greek Wedding, it's almost we're drawn in and we're, we feel that we're a part of that family, that we want to be a part of that family. And we yeah. think of all of the, the multiple scenes that we can memorize, the lines, and we get with our friends and we laugh or we watch the film again for the 10th time. And yeah. that's why we need more film, more cinema, and in this case, we need more romantic comedies because I think people are literally worn out from, well, the Marvel stuff. <laughs> yeah, and they're going in a strange direction. I was a Marvel. Marvel. I was a comic book artist. I almost got an apprenticeship with them back then. And I, well, in other words, I'm a fanatic with the Marvel comics, and I don't know where they're going with it. But anyways, that's that's not my business. But you, you, you see, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I'm with you. Having having you know, you said something interesting. These types of film are so relative, and especially when you have a family that's built around what I think is the genius of this film is it's built around the fact that even though it's a Greek family, I think. Uh, all families around the world, no matter what nationality, you know, what religion, no matter what religion, we all have those characters and those parent, those situational moments in our life from the, you know, with the parents and don't do, you know, just everything. And I'll tell you a quick story. I haven't told this in 20 years, but after the first one, I was doing a show. I just finished a show called Martial Law 
in Los Angeles with Samohan. It was a number one show as far as all the action in the martial arts, Chinese Kung Fu, etc. And I love my dim sum. I'll make it quick. I was eating downtown and Fat Wedding had came out. And I used to get recognized a lot back then for the martial law show, I had a big fan base. And I remember eating my dim sum and this big family and people are doing this and looking and I'm like, oh, martial law. And I walked over and said, hello. And they said, I said, uh, I'm, I love the show. And they said, no, not martial law, fat wedding. And they could hardly speak the language. Yeah. And that, that happened a lot where I realized, wow, all cultures um, are, you know, receiving the message. So, yeah, that's another reason why it was really it just the, the awareness on that response was pretty crazy. It, it opened my eyes to the, the wonderful damage it did around the world, which is we're all ultimately the same. Right. I mean, well, you know, you know and see what I love, what I love about the film is, you know, we see so many films today, um, you know, there could be uh, Asian films, uh, black films, Hispanic, Latino, the list goes on. But then you have this one that stands out based on a Greek family and everybody has their own personality. And, I, and again, this is the magic of this film. There are so many personalities. The moment someone starts talking, the audience wants to laugh. They want to embrace. They want to, they love that character. Uh, yeah. It's, it's an overload of I, an overload of love and family and that is really the, like you said, this is, it's the biggest thing that we need right now. And yeah. you guys keep delivering that. Yeah, um, I, it's great. I remember on the second one, again, I, sometimes as an actor, you know, it's pretty unresponsive sometimes. And it's a, it's a difficult road. Every actor that's committed his life to it understands that. And every now and then you get a little taste of what makes it worth it. And on the second one, there was, this happened a lot, but the, the most profound was on the second one where one gentleman lifted up his shirt and um, God bless him. He changed my life, you know, in a way, this guy, but I changed his. And that's, what's great about when you make a film that has impact to young kids and children around the world, he wasn't in a good place. He told me in a bad, bad place. And when he saw that movie and when I quoted uh, Tanir on the bed, something he had a tattooed on his ribbed and, he showed me that my quote in the movie and we hugged and, you know, it was just an amazing moment. And I'm thinking the impact this movie has had, you know, it's pretty cool as they all do in their own way, but it, it, the validity and the, 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 the payment on that moment was fantastic. It was made me realize, you know, well, wow, we, we can help and change people because we can get into their houses and their TVs through what we do. And it's, it makes sense after all these years, you know, well, yeah, you know, and I'm I'm one that loves I love action films. I'm a guy. I love I love that stuff. But I think the most memorable films are those that reach the heart. Uh, it spurs our emotion to ride along with the characters. If it's a if it's a romantic comedy, and to me, I think if if all of us are going to be quoting movie lines, besides quoting things from either a, a dirty Harry movie or <laughs> from maybe the Godfather, but it's the rom-coms that sometimes they have that line that stays with us forever. And my gosh, I mean, how many rom-coms did Tom Hanks do that right. we still watch and still remember to this day? This is why rom-coms need to be making this major uh, cinema push again, because yeah. we need more and you guys are leading the way. Yeah, yeah, we do. You know, on that, you just remind me of a Michael Constantine story. Uh, it's worth sharing. When the <laughs> I don't know how, but you just got me back to giving you another great moment with Michael. What I'm about to share with you in the world did happen, and you wonder the chances of something like this. So we wrapped my big fat Greek wedding, the first one. Hadn't seen anyone in a year or two. It was two years, actually, two plus years by the time they released it, and by the time it got to LA, probably even longer. So after all that time. We, me and I forget, I was with one friend and we went to see the movie. We found a theater. We got there. It was full, completely booked. I mean, I didn't, but I felt like saying, hey, I'm in it. Let me in. But but I didn't because <laughs> I'm not like that uh, unless I really need to be. But um, I said, all right, whatever. You know, it's full. And we tried like three or four. I, I remember weekends in a row. We couldn't get in, which I loved. Point of the story is this particular night, I said, I'm, well, I'm not going home. I want to see a film. What else is playing? And they said, Monsoon's Wedding. I don't know if you remember that movie. It was an Indian movie about a wedding similar to ours. Came out the same time. 
uh, we we obviously got all the play on Fat Wedding, but it was a wonderful film. So I said, okay, here's some money. And we went next door, me and my friend, to see it. When I went in, it was just starting. So I sat down, it was dark. The, the theater was empty. Empty, except two or three people, literally three seats in front of me. We watched the whole movie, beautiful film. Uh, the movie ends, the lights come on, and who turns around? It was Michael Constantine. I said, Michael? I said, you couldn't get in? He said, no, there was no seats. But that's a true story. That actually happened. So we went and had a beautiful coffee after that. But can you imagine? <laughs> that, that is, that is, a, that is one of the greatest stories. Because who would ever yeah. know? And the funny thing is, is I've, always, I've always wondered. So as an actor... Do you literally go into the theater to watch your own films? Because to me, it's almost like after maybe a private screening and walking the red carpet, you just go on to the next project. Um, do you like to watch your own films or the films that you appear in in a you know, theater setting? It's a good question. To be honest, it's the, the, the latter, meaning usually it's a screening and you're done with it, right? But if by chance it's got a good little theatrical run or – not just a theatrical run. It's always nice to see it with a, a neutral audience because at all these premieres and these screenings, they're all your peeps. So it's nice to sneak in with the hat, just in case, not that I'm anyone, that anyone should recognize that absolutely, but you know, getting in there with the hat. Yeah, I like it because you get a judge, you get to judge a, a different crowd and it's fun. Yeah. But oh, do, you, very, do you like to watch the, do you like to watch the audience's reaction? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And just to see how it plays with a, a neutral audience, you know, I've realized over the years too, every audience is different. Um, I think people, when they want to watch a movie, I tell everyone when I send links and screeners, don't watch it until you're really in the mood to watch a film or else they'll rip it apart. <laughs> Meaning the, the audience energy is just so different. Every screening, I, we screen Fat Wedding, uh, for example, a lot of different places. Every audience was different. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny yeah. because just recently I interviewed a series of film directors who were nominated for an Oscar for short films, um, a few at uh, at Cannes and then uh, Tribeca, and they were every single the ones for Tribeca was the funniest because they were so nervous because a lot of this is the first time that they were they ever had a film appear at an Oscar qualifying festival. And every single one of them were literally so nervous to walk into the theater to sit yeah. there with the rest of the audience. And some of them told me, I think I'm just going to look at the floor. <laughs> yeah. I don't sit when I'm, if I'm directing, cause I do a little directing. I'm not sure if you know that. Oh yeah. Years, yeah. When I direct, there's no chance I'm sitting. I'm, I tell everyone to sit and I'll pace up the back. I'll even pop in and out. Yeah. It's nerve wracking when you're at the helm and you're like, Oh my God, it's an actor, you know, <laughs> you do your oh, job. Oh, okay. See, now you're giving us a secret because being as an actor, you've done the job. You know what the film is like. Yep. But then as a director, that's your baby. That's your baby. And you're responsible at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I did a little bit of research and found out that you yourself have been extremely busy. And I counted, I think maybe what, 12 films uh, in post-production can you share some of those with us? Yeah, of course. Uh, 12? I can't remember 12. There could be years. more. <laughs> <laughs> um, the main ones that come to mind, besides obviously my big fat Greek wedding three, a um, couple of years ago, my dear friend and compadre, Brandon Schlegel, he's a writer-director. We've made a few films together. He called me up to Thailand to make uh, Battle of Saipan. I'm not sure if you've seen that one. It's a, a great little World War II film. And uh, yeah, we literally kicked ass and I got a chance to explore my action, as you mentioned earlier. And the wonderful Damon Hillen at Hillen Entertainment uh, noticed this and um, asked me if I wanted to direct his next film. And I said, of course, so Brandon wrote it. I created the story with Brandon. It's like this little click going on here that I really, really enjoy. I love working with these guys. So we made basically a trilogy in a sense of World War II movies. And uh, I directed two of them. And that was an incredible experience. So one is uh, Saipan's been released, I think, but now we have uh, Three Days in Malay, I believe September release, Paramount, uh, Operation Blood Hunt. I can't say too much about that one. It's pretty damn cool, but uh, yet to be uh, information coming soon on its release date, et cetera. 
And there's a couple more, yeah, but I just can't remember. You know, it's like, what's your favorite song? Tell me what else I got going on, Ward. <laughs> well, I, I had to go on IMDb. You know, that's that's our place to check everybody out. And I'm looking at your film list, and I'm like, and and all I see is post production, post production, post production. I'm like, my, I mean, like literally, you know, and for a lot of the viewing public, and you could probably give us some little secrets here because a lot of people don't know this. And I think Big Fat Greek Wedding 1 was really something that me, many people didn't know. It was filmed two years prior to its release. Ah, so, so I was right. I might say it, it sat on the shelf for two years, right? See? True yeah, story. So when you're, yeah, so when you're, let's say for you, if, if you're directing a film, uh, you have no idea when it's going to be released, do you? I mean, if you know, is it versus theater release versus streaming release? Sometimes it's preset, it's pre-bought, and sometimes it's not. Um, delivery is where you have a, an out, meaning you have a deadline for delivery. Once the film is delivered, the companies that own the picture obviously decide what route it will take. And sometimes it's pretty quick and sometimes it's not. Uh, for example, like I said, uh, Fat Wedding, as good as it was, no one wanted to touch it for the first two years because there was no explosions and, and A-list stars. And boy, was that a mistake. Your graphs can only get you so far, peeps. Take that from me. <laughs> it's true. Only so far. Uh, I say that from budgets to everything. You've got to, it's boots on the ground. You've got to get out there and work. But nonetheless, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, when I look back at uh, the first one, who would you say would be the most famous uh, famous person on set? Joey Fatone at that time? But then the, besides John Corbett? Isn't that interesting? It's, that's what I mean. I remember them saying there's no no huge stars and there's no explosions. I swear I remember that feedback. I'm like, wow, how wrong were you guys again? Um, I think Johnny Corbett would have been the biggest name in that, to be honest. I mean, John's pretty well known, Sex in the City, you know, all the shows. He's John's been, he has a large body of work. And Joey Fatone at that point, yeah, he, there you go. So Rita Wilson and Tom Hanks uh, are producers from the very beginning. Absolutely. I think without Tom and Rita, none of this would have been possible, according to my knowledge. And see, Tom knows, he knows extremely well that, you know, you do a film and then you're like, ah, it may not do nothing. I mean, and he, and he will say that when it came to Forrest Gump. Nobody saw that coming. Yeah, I heard it took them 10 years to get that finally done. That's what I heard. And who who knew? But well, there you go. That's why, you know, it's all, at the end of the day, you know, that's why I said graphs and, and budgets. It's every, this business. It is a business. It's show business, no doubt about it. But at some point, all these wonderful films that we've experienced, I think the filmmakers and the production companies took risks. I mean, Forrest Gump, what a friggin' risk. But these two legends, Tom and Zemeckis said, you know, man, we love it. We want to make it for the people. And I think that's, at the end of the day, what this business should really be. But look, I've got an independent company ward with my partner, Mark Klebanoff. We fight every week. We, we're having conversations on what are we going to make next? Well, we want to make this, but, oh, no, we have to make this because that guy did, you know, it's all these little, like I said. Well, do you, and do you have to, do you necessarily look at what the trends are in film? And do you jump on the trend or do you try to buck the trend? Well, in our particular case, we're a smaller company. I mean, if I was Paramount or involved in Paramount, I'd be taking big chances, like you said. I'd be doing the latter. But at, at our, with our company, we have to check the boxes because we're still responsible and we can't take too many losses on these motion pictures. So there's certain things you, you check and you know you're going to get a return on, you know. But uh, it's when you risk wig, you get the big rewards, as they did with Fat Wedding and Forrest Gump, et cetera. So, you know, that's where we're leaning to go in the next couple of years. For sure, we talked about it last week. It's time to start taking a few risks and doing some passion projects. Well, you, you know, know? I, I saw a short interview with Matt Damon, and he really gave clarity as to when a film is released in the theater. And back in the day when DVDs were huge, if you didn't hit your mark at the theater, you knew you could make it up in DVD sales, but that's kind of gone away. And when things go straight to streaming, that back end of that extra DVD sales is no longer there. I mean, what ha what has that idea done for um, all filmmakers? 
You know, I think it, it, it's changed dramatically. Obviously, f before the blockbuster demise, you know, let's say that era to now, it's changed dramatically. I mean, turnaround for filmmakers and investors like us is difficult. Sales has changed, like you said, dramatically. But there are, funny enough, other avenues opening. As You know, it's funny, one closes, others open. I mean, the streaming availability is huge and Tubi, et cetera, the new Netflix, I'm calling them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, yeah, they're going great, man. They're blowing up. Uh, a lot of other ones too, but this whole world has opened up. So there is a secondary platform, but it's not the same. Yeah, things have changed. Yeah, because yeah, it's, 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 it's the whole time. financial side that is, it's tough. Yeah, it's a harder ROI for filmmakers. Yeah, for sure. I, I would say that, especially right now, the markets, you know, but, you know, we need, we need the content at the same time. So I think we're in a good place. Well, you know, that's one of the things that I've noticed is that, the viewing public, and I've talked, I've said this to directors and other actors. The viewing public is the beast that has to continually be fed. Yeah. And streaming has become the feeding ground, and but funding is still not easy to get. Yeah, never will be. <laughs> I remember. I I, uh, I recall. I love uh, or Orson Welles. I watched nearly everything about that guy. And when he was a little old, actually a lot older in his last legs, they interviewed him and he said, any advice for filmmakers? And I'm watching this thing and here we go. What's the wonderful Orson going to share with us all? And he said something to the lines of, I wish I didn't spend so much time, uh, so much of my life trying to raise funds to make movies. I should have smelt the roses a little more, quote, unquote. And I was like, wow, bro. Oh my God. Yeah. Live a little because this film business will do that to you. You'll, I yeah, hear you. Lead you out because you, yeah. Yeah, te yeah. Te television's the same way. Yeah. And uh, funding is hard to get. Advertising's not always there. Um, yeah. Everybody has their own different idea. But I kind of dug back a little bit and realized that you were once a professional soccer player and you got into boxing. How did you translate that into acting? <laughs> Oh, man. Um, it's a great story. I'll, I'll try and make it quick. Yeah, I played soccer in Australia. I played a little in Greece. I played at the top levels there. I was a, a pro and I actually turned pro at 15 and a half with Melbourne, Hungary. And uh, Mickey Lynn, God bless you, saw my talent and turned me into a pro. After that, uh, it was a dream, but I got sidetracked because I had this passion for, for fighting and martial arts. So I was training religiously side by side with both of them and competing both side by side. Um, dad didn't like it, said, you're out. So I went to live with mom. He didn't like the boxing, he wanted me to soccer player. Anyways, my brother became an actor. He booked a movie with um, with uh, Teddy Atlas and Willem Dafoe called Triumph of the Spirit. An unbelievably uh, well-made film about uh, Auschwitz, you know, not the greatest, not the funnest of movie, but as far as storytelling, it's a must see. Uh, my brother scored this big movie. He broke into Hollywood and it, with Teddy Atlas being his new friend back then, I was turning pro as, as a fighter. So I said, I'm coming to visit LA. I went to LA. I sat in Costas's acting classes and I was training with the boxing every day. And the tr truly, this is how my life changed. There was a, I remember I had four or five fights for this these guys uh, from uh, the forum, Jerry Buss's guys. John Bay Rudy was his name. I still remember his name. Nonetheless, I was fighting for these guys. They said, okay, Saturday, Sunday, actually, well, you're going to fight for a contract. You have to meet us at the jail downtown. You're fighting a guy called The Fixer. He's a Mexican fighter. He's had 66 plus fights and he's a beast. If you can get through him, we're signing you. I said, oh my God. So it was a Saturday night. My friend Chris Stanley from a brother's acting class picks me up. We go to a party in Malibu. He says, you're nervous. Come for some water. So you don't think about the fight too much. I said, good idea. It was Mindy Marin, a big casting, up and coming casting lady back then, Mindy Marin. And she was casting a film called Necessary Roughness. So I go to this party. I meet her. She says, are you an actor? I lie at the time because I wasn't. I said, of course I am. She said, well, there's a role for you. Come in Monday morning. So getting to the point, Sunday, I went eight rounds with the fixer. And it was an absolute war. I was very badly hurt all over. But Monday I showed up and I booked the job. I went home and I got two simultaneous phone calls on the phone, the home phone, because it's how long ago it was. And one said, uh, you've got a 10 fight deal. You've got the contract. And the next one, it was Mindy Marin. And she said, you've booked Necessary Roughness as the Aussie rugger, if you've seen the movie, that doesn't want to wear pads. And I said, wow, what does that mean? And she ended up telling me what it meant. And I said, Mindy, I've got to be honest with you. I said, I'm a boxer. 
I said, I'm not an actor. And the day before the audition, someone kicked the hell out of me and I came in there and I don't really know what I did. And she said, I swear to God, she says to me, well, have him beat you up every morning before you come to set and you'll be just fine. That's how it ended. <laughs> and that's how my life changed, Ward, for real. That's when I quit the fight game and, and started really, then I studied, then I joined my brother's class, paid the money and I learned the craft after filming Necessary Roughness. So that's actually how my life changed. The soccer to the boxing, to the, the uh, getting hit in a different way in this show business world, yeah. Lewis, Body. I love, I love that story. I love the fact when, when people take a chance. Yeah, you weren't an actor, but if you just say that you are, look what happened when you said that you were. Look where you are now. Is that the crazy, craziest thing ever? It reminds me, I love quotes, Ward. I, rem I don't remember much, to be honest, these days, but I remember anything that I think is fantastic. And Jim Morrison once said, um, the difference between a singer and someone who can sing and someone who can't is confidence. He said, I, had, I remember, he, I read his book, No One Gets Out of Here Alive, until he said, man, I can do this. He, he couldn't sing, but he says, my voice never changed. I just had the confidence. And it's true. So it's a big part of it. Obviously, we have innate talent with vocal cords. But the point is, yes, you've got to risk. You've got to believe. And truth be told, when I was waiting in the room, I, I blasted through that story. There's so many funny moments. But one of them was, I'm recently off the boat from Australia. So I'm looking around the, the, the casting room and I'm seeing all these familiar faces, stars of TV shows and movies. And I'm like, God, what am I doing here? Am I kidding myself? So it still creeped in there because I was thinking about getting up and going home. And as I was about to get up and kind of pull the plug, because it got to me, man, it's pressure. If you haven't been on audition, people, it's a lot of pressure walking in that room with the producers and they're all staring at you. It's rough as guts, man, as we say in Australia, rough as guts. But as I was deciding to leave, uh, Mindy, I opened the door. I swear to you, man, just life sometimes. I, I still think about it. She said, Lewis, you're up. And I turned around and I said, oh, Let's go. Now it's fight time. You know, now I'm like, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. But uh, yeah, it was it was nerve wracking, as most network auditions are for actors. They're horrible in a sense. Yeah. You know, when I, when I hear people say, well, I can't do that or uh, that's not me. I'm like, no, you need to kind of go back and realize that if you step out, God will equip you if you will just say, Yes. Sometimes yeah. just go for it. If you succeed, yep. great. If you fail, you learned a lesson, get up and go yep. do it again. Yeah, absolutely right. And especially in this business, it's a lot of get up and do it again. So, uh, you know, uh, reflection of as, as life is as well, you know, it's going to be a lot of get up. And well, get I understand yeah. that you created a book of all of the storyboard drawings of your films that you direct. Is this something that uh, will ever be offered to the public? How did you know that, Ward? I haven't, I don't know, I don't think yeah. I've told. My you job that. is research. <laughs> uh, well, yes, I have a collection from when I first started uh, directing my boards and I have my folders, on, you know, all stacked at home. And I am planning on doing something. I think sometime towards the end of the year, I'm trying to create this online program where I can help young filmmakers, you know, tell them the, the grassroots of how to make independent films from, like I said, budgets to storyboarding and et cetera. But I love my boards. Uh, I obsess over them. I make my movie, the old school. I make it before I get to set. I've got my ins and outs, my conceals, my reveals. I've got my illustrations. I've got my lenses. I've got everything. So these two World War II movies that I made, I did them in 10 days, mind you. So when you, Why, know, you did, so each one you filmed in 10 days? Uh, the first one was 10 days. The second one was 12 days because we had werewolves. <laughs> you know, yeah, I am I amazed have, that films, films don't take understand. six months to do anymore. Well, 10 days is absolutely unheard of and i will not do it again but i did it is you know because of the boards is the point because i was so prepared there was absolutely no lag or no discussions in between setups but i'm pretty proud of that that we did a world war ii movie in 10 days and it, it looks damn good too well, so you know generally you in, it's three well you were in rambo last stand wasn't that film done in 21 days uh, I only had a couple of days on it. I don't know because I was. They filmed part of it here in Sofia, Bulgaria, and I happened to be here. So the casting, 
a lady who's a friend of mine said, hey, there's a, a role open with Sly. And I said, I'm in, you know. I don't even think they paid me on it. I just I just went there and shot and went home. I swear. I, I don't even remember doing anything. I just went and left because I just wanted to work with him. But yeah, uh, 21 days, you know, I'm not sure, but you can do things in the 10 days. I mean, yeah, and it rained, it rained two of those days, by the way. And then there's, you know, it's, yeah. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm real excited about those films. And again, the boarding is my saving grace. And it's wonderful for me because I have now the ability to bring part of my, my passion, which is illustration, into my own business affairs now. So the directing is becoming a bigger part of my life than the acting now, funny enough. And I'm really happy about it because, um, yeah, I just really, I enjoy helming and creating and boarding and working well, you with you actually life. illustrate your own storyboards. I do everything. Yeah, I don't outsource. I do absolutely everything. Yeah. And that that's about three weeks in a room, six hours a day prepping after I've seen locations. Yeah. Well, I think we can call you a mega director if the director is actually doing his own storyboards. I'll take that compliment. I don't know how many can and do, but I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying doing it. It's, it helps me, you know? Uh, yeah, it's more like, uh, well, Coppola, do you write your own storyboards? Scorsese, do you write your own storyboards? <laughs> Too funny. I did share with you that Jordan Martyr, I did a movie for him. If you haven't seen it, people, it's a beautiful film. My brother stars in it for me with Jordan and Bill Sage. It's called The Blackout. The post is horrid, the company that took it, and I'll say it just for some reason in sales. I'm in the sales business. They put posters on it, and there's no rhyme or reason, but it's called The Blackout. Uh, fantastic film. So when they hired me, they didn't know much about me, Jordan and a few other producers, and I'm a little unorthodox. I just am. I'm a street boy from Melbourne, Australia, and when I do my art and I'm passionate, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little out there, but I'm obsessive. So they were having all these production meetings and I kept saying, waste of time, don't want to go, call me when you're done. And I kept hanging up the phone. This went on for a week, we had a two and a half week pre-production. And I would only go if I felt like, anyways, they all got nervous and they knocked on my door. I had this little bungalow room, yeah? And after four, five, six days, they said, Lewis, we're coming in to check on you. You haven't come to any meetings. We just want to know what's going on in here. And I remember I had a ciggy and I'm like, yeah, come on in, have a look. You're worried, right guys? Do you want to see your movie? right now and they said what's up and i had my movie all my boards uh, pasted around the hole and they walked around three times because they were in lower rows and they watched the whole movie and then he looked at me shook my hand he says we're never bothering you again see you on set yeah so that was a great story i tell that one because yeah i drew the whole movie there it is what have i been doing for a week that's what i've been doing what have you, you been doing all right whoa, whoa 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 i just had a thought for you do you realize that that alone oh. is a short film or a movie what, oh, what is that? What I just said? Yeah, because uh, have you seen the offer? Uh, the one I'm in? No, no. Yeah, the, the movie The Offer. Yeah, well, yeah, the one, yeah. That, the TV it's all, series? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the making of it. Godfather. Yeah, yeah I haven't yeah. seen it. I love it. Did you like I, Mickey Cohen? I loved the whole movie. It, it was one of the greatest works of cinematic art I've ever seen because the story. Wow. You're, I'm like, uh, I, w I want to watch it again because for me, watching the backstory of an iconic film, there's so much story there. But here you are in a room creating all these storyboards. That's a film. I like it. That is, I like it. That is a film of may maybe it's a director that's so eccentric. Who knows? Maybe he's got a little bit of Stanley Stanley Kubrick in him, and he closes up like this is my vision. But then it's got to get made. And then, like you said, these guys walk in and they're like, "Oh, good lord!" <laughs> Interesting. What if he's boarding in like L.A. But everything he boards, it could be like some crazy scary movie and everything he boards is coming to life in a different part of town you just gave me that idea it's oh actually i and love that he realizes it did we just create a screenplay ward did we yes could you imagine story doing the storyboards it's it's almost like the it's almost like a murder mystery where you're you're writing it ahead of ahead before it actually happens but then when you do it it happens and then all of a sudden everybody's freaking out that's a movie yeah. And he realized, and what about if he erases it? Oh, I don't like that, but some dude's already been shot. What would happen, huh? Would he come and back it, to life? You, it's almost like changing, well, <laughs> it's like changing the future, 
But if it already happened, it's like going back in a time machine and then it's erased and corrected. Yeah. Let me tell you, we're onto something here. We have copyright. Anyone who listens to this, we have official. Yes. Copyright. Yes. We, we have it. We have it on tape. So nobody can steal this. It's not bad, actually. Ward. It's not bad at all, man. No, just just some fine tuning and tweaking. But when, <laughs> when you told me that story, I'm like, and then I thought about the offer and I'm like, that's a movie. That is the right. basis of a movie. So, ladies and gentlemen, get ready because there's going to be a new blockbuster coming soon to theaters, <laughs> directed by Lewis Mandalore. <laughs> so, I hope so. Yeah, I was going well, to say that's one of my that's one of my oils. It's my little setup here in Europe. I don't have much here, but I bought a little easel, so I've been snapping away. Yeah, I'm not well, really good with it. I'm just practicing. Well, yeah, it's amazing how many. Uh, actors and recording artists that I talk to. And it's amazing how many pick up the paintbrush and, yeah. and, uh, and the guitar. Yeah. And you know, you know, and in all your locations, my gosh, I mean, I I've seen the, the, I mean, photography that, yeah. uh, and I love the fact that nobody's a professional. So you get <laughs> their eye, you get their uh, emotion, I guess yeah. through, through that type of art. And, uh, for yeah. you though, uh, do you have a dream role that you would like to have? Um, at this point, um, I think I've done a lot of ultra violence. I've done a lot of comedy. I think just uh, uniquely, you know, uh, it, just character driven roles. They're always real entertaining. I did a couple more this year that I really enjoyed. Yeah, if the material's good, it's always appealing. Yeah, but I love the directing now. I'm focusing on that a lot this year. But obviously, a good role comes along. It's always a challenge and, and a great experience. Yeah, open to that for sure. Well, how just one last question. How much for an actor that when you've stepped foot into the director's chair and you've directed one or two films and then you take an acting role, um, do you look at things differently now? Uh, yeah, when I started making films, which was quite a while ago, uh, yeah, you do. You do more so when you're helming. Just the way the sets run, just the way everyone treats the actors, things you wouldn't do that they're doing. Uh, uh, in my case, that's a lot. So, you know, <clears throat> I, I think directing the last five, six years has come back into my life and it's made me a little more... I have a, I have a, a shorter, let's say, a, a short fuse on set when things go wrong now because when you're helming, you have a responsibility to look after people. Even if it's an independent film, I do. On any film I ever make, everyone's looked after. Uh, and some films you get on set and you just, it's just a little upside down. And that's the things you see. Whereas an actor, maybe you'd miss them. You're just into your own thing. But yeah, the, the horizon broadens and you start saying, man, what's up with that? And, you know, then it becomes a little difficult, actually. But yeah. Yeah. So then I guess you put a little in your pocket. So when you direct a film, you're like, okay, I don't want to be that guy. Or you pick up something very positive from another director. You're like, oh, I like the way he did that. Or, or I like the way he handled that situation. And you're like, I'm going to remember that. Sure, you learn. You learn from people that are more experienced and better than you. And, and uh, a couple of guys that I love and I've learned a lot from, you know, Jesse V. Johnson, uh, a dear friend. And uh, he's taught me a lot. Uh, very humble guy. And he, he very smart man. And he, he's just so, he runs the set just in, in such a great way. William Kaufman another guy who's been really good to me, who is really, really calm on set, which I am not. I'm the opposite. I'm a little, I don't know. Yeah, I'm the other way. But um, yeah, you do learn. Uh, David Arnspar was a, a, I learned a lot from David Arnspar. I'm not sure if you recall, David. We did The Game of Their Lives or The Golden Goal with Gerard Butler uh, in Brazil. It was, a, it was an older film. Miracle Match, I think, was the title that released in the States. But yeah, I've worked with a lot of directors. And yeah, you've got to learn. You've got to take it all in, take the, the best and then create your own, I guess, your own uh, style, if you can call it that. Yeah. And, you know, Lewis, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I know that you are so extremely busy. And I know that uh, the whole crew for My Big Fat uh, Greek Wedding 3 is ramping up to do the major press push. Uh, but you got another smash hit on your hands. 
Let's hope so, Ward. God bless you, man. Thank you again so much for having me on the show. It was wonderful to get to know you and talk to you. And let's see if the uh, the movie gets the, the love it deserves. We hope so, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm expecting you to give the greatest love to my big fat Greek wedding three. You know you're a fan of the first one. You're a fan of the second one. And you are going to be a fan of the third one. And so... Get to the theaters. Look, it's not just Tom Cruise bringing the theater back to life. These guys have Louis Bandelore, the whole crew, the whole cast of My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3 going to light up the theaters again, this time with a romantic comedy that will pull at your heartstrings. So get to the theater. Pre-buy your tickets if you have to. It's coming to the theaters September 8th. Fill up every seat because you're going to love it. You're going to fall in love with it. You're going to laugh. Who knows? You may even cry. Don't know about that yet, but who knows? But nothing wrong with that. And again, Lewis, again, thank you for sharing us your, sharing your time with us today. Thank you so much, Ward. It was a pleasure. Bless you all and uh, talk soon, mate. And uh, back to you on that screenplay. I'll be sending you the new synopsis. Uh, do that and I will be ready for it. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for watching the, the Ward Bond show. And hey, I'll see you next time.